I'll wait till I'm officially on the clock here. <laughs> uh, so first, thank you again for uh, having me up here. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, like I said this morning, I'm part of a, a team that's with me, uh, Simon, Cass, and Devin. And uh, we're pretty excited about uh, our idea. It's uh, nice that I got to present this morning, because now I feel like I'm talking to a group of friends rather than a group of strangers. It makes it a little bit easier. Uh, so our idea, uh, we're referring to it as MERS SPLASHSAT, Microgravity Experimental Research Satellite. Uh, and I'll get to this later, but if we're working with SPLASHSAT, the idea is to bring the satellite back into re-entry so that, I guess if it lands in the water, we'll call it SPLASHSAT. If it lands on land, we'll call it SPLATSAT. So uh, we're going to go through a few items here. Uh, we're going to talk about what we think is a, a real need uh, for the type of satellite we're going to propose, and then uh, the ideas that we have to fill that need. We're going to go through how we think that this can be implemented uh, through a business case, why we think people will want it. Uh, with that, there's certainly going to be some challenges, uh, so we're going to discuss those and talk about our vision. Uh, this is more than a one satellite idea, we, we hope. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the requirements we have. Uh, they're very general at this point. This is an idea. We're fully committed to pursuing it. Uh, but we wanted to give ourselves sort of a broad scope at this point. And then uh, we'll talk about what the potential first mission would be and uh, the value in that. So first, uh, what we feel is, is a need right now, uh, there's a growing desire to do research in outer space for a whole broad category of things. Uh, our focus going into this for the satellite development is going to be on uh, materials research, crystal growth experiments, uh, protein crystal growth. I was very excited to be here for the symposium that we were actually able to meet with a few people that do this sort of research. Uh, we're going to be collaborating with them, uh, Dante from the University of Florida, and finding out more about uh, how this satellite can be developed to suit those needs. Right now, if you want to do research in outer space, uh, from our understanding, there's basically three options. You can go through the ISS, which involves uh, a long time frame, uh, quite a few hoops to jump through. You have to disclose a fair amount of what your idea is to uh, a group. Uh, for safety reasons for the ISS, but also so that uh, astronauts can conduct these experiments. And uh, disclosing IP isn't always something that people want to do. You can go through NanoRacks, which is a new concept, which is onto the ISS. Uh, and NanoRacks is going to be what we set as our sort of minimum requirements, using them as a basis. And the third option is a custom build through places like MDA or, uh, or uh, some, some company like that. Uh, but that's not really a good option if you want to do research because it takes a long time and there's very high costs. So we feel that these three things sort of, at this point, restrict access in time frame for the ISS and custom build and in terms of uh, size potential in uh, the NanoRacks case. So our idea to fill that need is to build a recoverable microsatellite for materials research and uh, various other researches. Uh, we want it to be recoverable. Right now, uh, there is not really a potential to bring your experiments back. Uh, on the NanoRex, I say they do offer it for a cost. They didn't say what that cost is. Uh, but really, it's based on what the return schedule for the capsules is going to be. It's only Dragon X, uh, Dragon Capsule, that, or SpaceX Dragon Capsule that's able to bring anything back. There's a very high cost in that because space is very limited. The, uh, Orbital Sciences craft doesn't return, so that, that isn't an option. So there's, great, uh, there's a great potential here for experimenters to actually get their hands on what they're doing. And the crystal growth area, I feel like if you can get your hands on that crystal and really take a look at it, that that's a great benefit to the researchers. And certainly whatever other researchers uh, want to do experiments, I think that that's going to be a valuable asset to them. So the initial mission is going to develop the technology required to have a recoverable satellite that's capable of conducting an experiment and uh, build a generic platform that can be adapted for any kind of a research mission. So like I said, uh, using sort of the NanoRacks as a model uh, to get some idea of what we could offer, 
Uh, they're a primary competition, potentially. One big problem with this is that right now the ISS is scheduled to be decommissioned in 2028, even though that's uh, 15 years out. That time frame is going to go by quickly, I think. Uh, it's already been, that date's already been pushed back a couple of times, so it's uh, maybe not very likely that they're going to keep pushing it back. Uh, what we'd aim for in terms of a, a launch cost would be about, uh, on a per U basis, what that means, what per U means is that uh, if our capacity for experiments is around 10 U, we would aim to multiply these costs by about 10, using that as a bar. Uh, there's one obvious sort of caveat to this, and that's uh, the researchers that use these don't actually have to buy a satellite, so that would be an additional cost. But we think being able to get your hands on the experiment would offset that cost. And these are very broad numbers. We're hoping to, uh, over the next year, to develop this and come up with some much uh, more hard and fast cost uh, estimates. And again, this, these costs don't include getting your experiment back. And then uh, we're going to be using, well, we're, we're, not, we're not going to be limited to the CubeSat standard, which right now uh, most experiments are. So some uh, business challenges. Uh, if, if the word gets out that this is a, an area of need, uh, potentially we could be, have some challenges from larger satellite players. We already know that SpaceX is developing something called Dragon Lab. We view this as sort of a double-edged sword. On one hand, they have the money to wipe us out. On the other hand, I don't think they'd be putting money into it unless they saw that there was some sort of a need for a next generation research platform. Uh, we think we can, can build this. Uh, satellites and maybe even compete with uh, with Elon. That would be fun. So another risk, uh, of course, is that if we promise that this can come back and we aren't able to develop that technology, there's some ri liability uh, and failed returns. Uh, if we have too many failed missions, it might be hard to get more customers on board. So that's why we're hoping to have a prototype mission to do a, a proof of concept of the technology. And uh, the sort of, the number of th systems that have to be added to make a satellite work. Uh, we're hoping for a 50% payload availability, or 50% mass availability for the payload. Uh, but if the systems, in that 50 ca kilogram category, if the number of systems, the, the mass of the systems required to bring that back down uh, successfully is too great, then uh, it might not be possible to, to complete this project, but that's something that's going to come out in the studies that we'll conduct in the next year. So power requirements, again using nanoracks as a standard on a per U basis, uh, would be 2 watts power, 2 watts cooling, and then whatever additional power is needed for the ADCS and uh, communications. The environment, we want to be able to offer as a pressurized environment. We want to be able to have uh, whatever sort of gaseous makeup uh, that might be required by the experiment available. So if, say, nitrogen is a particularly good uh, environment with which to conduct the experiment, we want to be able to provide that with pressure, as well as control uh, the, thermal, the thermal conditions of the capsule uh, as the experiment requires. So the mission, uh, we'd like to be able to go longer than 30 days. That's what NanoRacks is, is limited to. We think uh, being able to go past that is not only perfectly reasonable for a satellite to do. Uh, we think that would be, again, uh, something desirable for, uh, for a customer, for a researcher. And then, uh, it would also be nice if we can come up with some sort of damping system to, to minimize the uh, vibration as you come back into the atmosphere. And Sean will reflect on that uh, as a response to, to our presentation here. And then I said a big driver on this is uh, the goal to bring the experiments back down. So we're, we're going to ask that uh, or require that there be a reentry capability. Uh, if we can't get that, then there isn't, we don't see there'd be too much of an advantage taking this route over a NanoRex case. Uh, we think it's possible. There's examples of this being done in the past uh, through spy satellites have been able to get uh, tapes back down. And there's also, I think, a Japanese satellite that was able to reenter. So we think it's possible and we're going to work towards that. So the first mission, the prototype mission, would be a demonstration uh, that the technology works, that we can put a payload up, bring it back down. The first payload on that first mission will be uh, twofold. One, it'll gather all of the flight dynamic data, uh, telemetry, 
vibration and thermal conditions so that we know what we can guarantee to the researchers. And even if this program were to get that far and stop at that first mission, we think that there's value in having that data available. Uh, it's my understanding that there's not actually that much data on what happens in reentry anymore. Um, so that would be, we think there's value in just seeing this through at least a, a first mission basis if, if the full program isn't able to be realized. And uh, so working with Sean and the University of New South Wales and us at the U University of Victoria, we have a plan to make this happen. We've already been collaborating. We've already been sort of working out the requirements, what's capable, what's not. At the University of Victoria side, we're able to offer uh, undergrad student capstone projects, uh, work terms. There's always students uh, looking for opportunities to take on projects like this, as well as uh, potentially some graduate work. I didn't put it on there because we haven't talked to supervisors yet, but uh, we don't see any obstacles to that in the next 12 months. And uh, Sean will be able to talk more about his side, uh, but uh, I think graduate student projects as well as undergrad student projects at the University of New South Wales. So to conclude uh, the user portion here, uh, we think that there's a need for this. We think that it's a perfectly reasonable pro program and we think it's worth pursuing. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Sean now. Hi, good afternoon everybody. I'm Sean Tuttle from University of New South Wales in Canberra. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank every, um, the UNISEC organizers for bringing me over here and giving me this opportunity. It's been very good. And also thank you for those who provided the really good nut biscuits and chocolate things at lunchtime. Um, the clock's ticking rapidly, so I better get on. I just want to introduce myself and my side of the team and then show you basically how we're going to go about doing this and, and what we think is important. So yes, key mission requirements from the developer's point of view, the plan for doing the work and, and how we go, I'm going to try and put a team together and what the key technical challenges are and a quick word maybe at the end on technical feasibility. That's the university in Canberra there, we're a small campus, um, part of a larger university. We have, well I have some colleagues who are going to be involved as we get going, um, Andrew Neely and Sean O'Byrne. Both of them have a strong background in hypersonic aerodynamics and, and re-entry work and I do too in fact from the, the mid 90s when I worked with JAXA for a short while on high flex. But to be honest, my background is really with big spacecraft, deep space missions like Rosetta and Bepi Colombo. So this is also quite new for me, but also exciting. And we have access to our, our own shock tunnel and if necessary, high altitude balloon flights. But that will all come out as we study this in more detail. So basically, um, some of the, the key mission requirements from the developer's perspective are obviously number one, the recovery of the satellite or part of it, or uh, that's a big question in itself. Then Terrell's desire to have a payload mass fraction of 50%, which we will, we will aim to achieve. Um, no expulsive ASCS actuators, so no thrusters. The experiment volume uh, which he's requested, which we have already as a good team iterated on and reduced significantly because I thought this was maybe generous. And then the thermal and mechanical environments necessary for the payload, we have to establish those quite early on so that we know what we're aiming for with the rest of the design. But because the clock's ticking rapidly, um, I should really just say mission uh, requirement number one is really the one that drives everything. Almost everything follows on from there. It drives assuming, which is still an assumption, that we recover the whole satellite, then the external shape is automatically quite constrained and defined. So is its um, internal configuration in that we need the center of gravity in a certain location for stability. The external area and therefore power that we can generate in orbit is you know, constrained or dictated by that, that aspect. Thermal design goes without saying. and 
the useful volume that we can offer for payload. So really that is a, it has a disproportionate effect on the, the whole mission, but of course it's what also distinguishes the mission as a, as a unique one. So we will, I'll just show you a rough plan of attack on the parts of the job which I think need do doing. This shows a fairly traditional type work breakdown structure for a project of this nature. On the left in the yellow we've got the um, so, yeah. the sort of running of the project type roles. We, here we have the mission and the system, the aspects we need to think about, what it's going to comprise, the breakdown, operations, how it will run, what are Terrell's mission requirements and uh, which ones need iteration. We need to think a bit about the launch vehicle in this first 12 months phase. The budgets here, I mean the technical budgets, we need to keep an eye on, of course. And then the verification is an important one because apart from the normal satellite verification aspects, we need to look at the re-entry part. And then we've got the satellite part itself, the re-entry phase aspects, the aerodynamics and how we'll slow it down and land it. And then the payload on the right, which um, the University of Victoria people will cover largely. Um, I focused on some of the things in red just to show you uh, where we are at the moment with putting together a team. I've picked out the things which I feel are critical in this first phase and you know, some we, we won't be able to do everything but some things definitely need addressing. And so, for example, Terrell and I will cover a lot of the system level stuff. Um, AOCS is currently a, an open area, we need to find someone to cover that, perhaps some of the other people from UVic can do that. Electrical configuration, I've got a uh, fourth year student going to do his thesis on that next year, plus we have Druva Space in India who are keen to participate and offer some of their um, low power transmitter ideas, so they will also be involved in the RF aspects for which um, we, I also have a thesis student. Mechanical and thermal I'll probably cover largely. Um, we're looking for a student to look at the aerodynamics, um, both on our side and in UVic. I think we have a possible volunteer. And then on the entry, descent and landing part there, I'm thinking about parachute system and some sort of shock absorbing system. I already have a student who's got ideas for that. So those things have covered. Then looking further ahead, we have our own wind tunnels. I've been to visit an old colleague at JAXA on Tuesday. And so further down the track, we may be able to use the arc tunnel there that they used for the Hayabusa testing. Um, then we're very fortunate to have our friends across town at the Advanced Instrumentation Technology Center with some nice shiny new testing facilities for any satellite that we do get to build. Um, and then I thought as a, an interesting idea, it might, it might be good to have an external review panel set up. So I've got some former colleagues from Astrium Germany and Astrium UK who have agreed to look over what we're doing once or twice during the 12 months. Um, I've put together a quick uh, top five technical challenges. These depend on the day and on my mood as to which, which is most critical, but really the re-entry heating, the stability and the deorbiting, I think all could take a uh, top spot. Um, mass or power, I think power is probably going to be more challenging than mass. And then I think we must look at the non-technical challenges too, the funding and finding a launch, ground stations where I'm happy to learn we might have options now in Canberra, India and Canada for this. Um, funding in general and for this one legal, we need to look at it early, all the regulatory issues and again our friends at UVic have got some contacts in legal department and so this is something we need to look at because the selection of the landing site, country and, and location could have backward effects on 
you know, the launcher we end up selecting or the launches to which we are restricted or, or the orbits that we fly and because we want to keep the spacecraft as simple as possible and not have big capacity for changing changing orbits when it's time to come down. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation. It's time to finish the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, we have the five minutes for the question and answer. Is there any question from reviewers? Thank you very much for your presentation. Just one obvious question is uh, re-entry, if you have an experiment in zero G, crystal growth for example, uh, the re-entry conditions is much different. You have huge decelerations, enormous amount of heat uh, to be uh, get rid of, otherwise your, your crystals may melt or they may shatter due to shock or or heat. So I think that's maybe the critical thing. That's one observation from my side. The other one is to recover. I think that can also be a great cost that you have to look at uh, adding the total cost of a mission like this. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. I agree. Um, the, the thermal aspects are clear and I think not, not easily but quite comfortably managed with a, a sensible design. I think Hayabusa is a very good benchmark because it, it'll be a similar size to this. Their temperature range that they had to keep for the return stuff from the asteroid was you know, in the minus 20 to plus 5 degree range. So if we isolate the interior correctly, then, then it's quite doable. The other thing that we need to know, and Terrell will be looking at, is what, you know, what accelerations can crystals take on a, on a re-entry. That's why I'm assuming we'll need some sort of impact um, device. To reflect on that too, uh, we mentioned crystal growth is sort of uh, what we're looking at primarily right now, but it's important to point out that we're looking at this as a broader spectrum beyond that, being making it available for any sort of research. Uh, so it's a very good, valid point that'll need to be considered for that specific type of research, uh, but we're also looking to make this available to, to other kinds as well. In your presentation, it was not quite clear to me which part of it is really reusable. And uh, <coughs> also the, the mass distribution, 50% for payload or for the experiments, and the rest is for, for the bus and, and, and all the things you need to, to cover, re-entry, control of re-entry, uh, data reception and, and, and sending, and thermal control, entry control, landing system, putting into that. That all can be done with 50% of what you envisaged to have uh, to be launched? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I think that will be like the volume requirement. The, I, th I think this will go through the natural process of any pre-phase A type study. We started, or Terrell said, this is what we'd like. And we need to see how realistic that is. Unfortunately, I didn't get to my conclusion. I just wanted to say, I, I, on bal I think it's technically feasible. The question on the business case still remains. But as a wise man said earlier this week, you know, when you're doing something for the first time, you should keep it simple. And I think we, we will be striving to do that as much as possible on the spacecraft part. It's because regardless, I don't think you can make the re-entry simple at all. So we recognize that it's, that is the big challenge. So what we have in orbit and what provides the environment for the, uh, the experiments and so on, that will be as simple a you know, cube set with a different shape as possible. I think that, that's really the only way to succeed with this because clearly you know, getting the thing back is the big challenge. And it, even that in itself, is, as we touched on before, is how much do we bring back? I think my gut instinct is it better to bring the whole thing back rather than to drop something because then you need a more complex satellite. Um, yeah, and maybe you offer customers the option. You, know, you can have a quick microgravity experiment that you do get back, but if you have this much money, you could, you could get it back. And not all experiments will you know, need to be brought back. So 
yeah, those, are, those are all things that we're going to look at. One more question? Uh, yeah, uh, this is a very interesting uh, approach. Uh, I think this kind of uh, mission uh, should be considered the uh, marketing aspect, uh, uh, customer behind you. Uh, I think. Uh, I think. Do you think who will be become the customer uh, of your mission, and uh, uh, have you uh, already confirmed their uh, thinking value? Or of this uh, mission. So that'll be uh, part of what we would do over the next 12 months. Uh, we've spent some time researching and you know, this is our idea. Uh, one of the things we'll be looking at is, is how uh, well received it'll be. Uh, like I said, we, th we think we fit on an area that, that needs looking at. Certainly the ability to continue research in some form uh, once the ISS is done. Uh, I, I don't think there will be any desire to stop research. So this is uh, one way potentially of, of looking at that problem over a longer term. And uh, we'll certainly be asking around over the next 12 months to see what kind of reception there would be. But I don't imagine that uh, there won't be any. Uh, certainly just in the sm few conversations we've had, just in the past few days, people seemed interested. In, uh, speaking with Dante from Florida, said when they do their crystal growth experiments, they said there'd certainly be some value to the researchers to get that back. I can't imagine that uh, there aren't any researchers out there that wouldn't want to, to also get some of their experiments back, which is limited right now and, and uh, won't be possible once the ISS is done. So it's a very valid point. We'll be looking at it uh, over the next 12 months as we develop the feasibility study. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Let's move to the next team.